Right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining in. We are here uh, today for the live webinar uh, on ischemia imaging part one, the brain and its pathologies. Um, just before we uh, move forward, I'd like to introduce myself, Mina Lini Lakshman. I'm the uh, scientific applications uh, manager here at Fujifilm Visual Sonics. Um, thanks for joining your webinar on shaping high resolution imaging. Uh, we will be moving on to some housekeeping notes. Um, a recording of the webinar is being made available to you at the end. Um, all lines will be muted. Please use chat window for your questions. We uh, really encourage your questions to be uh, put into the chat window uh, during the webinar. Uh, we will answer these questions at the very end. The expected duration for this presentation is 45 minutes with about 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Um, and these webinars will be available to you um, on the website. Now, that brings me to, of course, the introduction of our speaker today, uh, Andrew Heinmiller, fondly known as Drew. Um, he is the lead scientist here at uh, Visual Sonics on uh, applications R&D for the Vivo Laser photoacoustic system. He particularly works uh, with collaborators, uh, particularly scientists, on the development of real-time oxygen saturation measurements. He's also worked on non-invasive sentinel lymph node visualization and photoacoustic photo contrast agents uh, for molecular imaging with the emphasis on deep tissue reporter imaging. Um, you can see this uh, work of his uh, published now with collaborators in, in the science reports uh, 2014 of this year. Drew uh, comes to us uh, with his master's degree in neurobiology at the University of Toronto here in Canada, and he brings a thorough understanding of the brain anatomy uh, complemented with its histology and function uh, to the field of uh, medical imaging. So without further ado, I'm going to share the presentation rights uh, to Drew so that he can take us upon the journey of uh, photoacoustic imaging uh, brain and its pathologies. Thanks very much, Mina, and uh, thanks everyone for, for joining today. Uh, as Mina described, uh, you know, I'm going to be talking uh, a lot today about brain imaging and, and how we do brain imaging with the, um, with the photoacoustic and, and micro-ultrasound system. Uh, as a general agenda, uh, we're just going to start with uh, an introduction to standard brain imaging techniques, then move on to micro-ultrasound, what is it and what are some of the tools we can use for brain imaging, then on to photoacoustics, what is it, um, what are some of the photoacoustic tools for brain imaging? And we're just going to end with one slide on, on the future of this, as this is a fairly new um, application uh, area for us. Just as an introduction, uh, I want to show some images here, uh, images that uh, those of you who are, are doing brain research are, are likely very familiar with, uh, images from uh, MRI, micro-CT, PET, SPECT, as well as histology in various different planes, the, the coronal, sagittal, and, and the transverse views of the brain. Uh, and each of these different modalities um, gives us a different information. So we've got uh, MRI for anatomical, functional MRI and PET SPECT for, for functional brain imaging to, to um, you know, image uh, metabolism and, and um, um, blood flow uh, hemodynamics uh, to measure brain function, micro CT for uh, vascularization, uh, and then histology for a wide variety of things. So these are all very powerful techniques and are, are widely used in the brain um, in, in brain research, um, but they also have some drawbacks as well. Most of them are, are very expensive. They can be time consuming. Uh, they're not really real time in, in, in the true sense where, um, and this can be important, uh, being able to see very uh, rapid changes. And, and I'll describe some of that, uh, the importance of that real time uh, a little later on. There's also, um, most of these modalities don't allow you really to do longitudinal um, studies, um, or rather the histology does not allow you to do longitudinal studies, which is, is also important, um, especially if you're using uh, ionizing radiation as well. Um, it doesn't allow you to do repeated doses necessarily uh, in order to do these longitudinal studies where you follow the same animal over time uh, to see changes and use the same animal as its own control. Um, now, with micro-ultrasound, uh, I'll just briefly describe how it works, and then I'll, I'll describe some of its advantages. Um, we've got an ultrasound transducer, which transmits a sound wave through a coupling medium like gel. It goes into the target uh, of interest, and the sound is reflected, and we can build an image out of that uh, reflected and then uh, detected sound. 
Um, this image that you're seeing here uh, is a mouse embryo, and essentially anything that's bright in this image is reflecting the sound strongly. Anything that's dark is transmitting the sound um, uh, freely. Um, now, the advantages here <clears throat> include things like real-time imaging. So we can then, um, you know, we can then uh, we get high resolution at depth, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, but we get this real-time, non-invasive in vivo imaging. We can have multiple imaging sessions um, and look at the same animal over time, as I mentioned. Now, the difference between our high-frequency system and the typical clinical ultrasound systems is the frequency. What does this translate to? Well, uh, frequencies of 3 to 15 megahertz gives you about 200 to 300 micron resolution. We're using uh, frequency in the 30 to 80 megahertz range, which gives you down to 30 micron resolution. And if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, um, these images actually look like they're the same resolution, but the top image you're seeing a, a human fetus and the bottom image you're seeing a mouse fetus. So you can really see the difference. You're, you're looking at something quite large versus something that's very, very small, and you're getting very, very high resolution in that small object. So the, the short message here is high frequency equals high resolution. Uh, this is a, just a video uh, essentially of a, a, a beating mouse heart. It's slowed down, obviously, um, but, but now you can really uh, get a sense of the real-time aspect of the imaging here. The cardiac imaging is really our bread and butter because the ultrasound is used in the clinic for doing cardiac uh, imaging and assessment, and of course this translates very well a lot of cardiac research that, um, that people are doing. Uh, so this real-time aspect is, is sort of demonstrated here. Um, and, and, and the sort of additional advantages of having um, real-time imaging are things like uh, precise interventions, like image-guided injections. So you can see in this image here, you've got uh, actually an excised um, uh, or an externalized embryo here, and you can see this is the head with the fourth ventricle. Uh, I think this is a, it says here on the E12 embryo. Um, you can see on the left-hand side of that image, you can see um, that the, we have a micro injector here, uh, as well as the, the ability to control a pulled glass needle and visualize that needle going in and directing it going in uh, into the fourth ventricle in this case of this animal. This, of course, can be used um, to direct cells, uh, drugs, other contrast agents um, into, uh, into this area. Uh, and be able to uh, deliver drugs there, re, uh, readmit the, um, the embryo into the mother, bring that embryo to term, and then see the effects of the, the cells, stem cells, for example, or, or different drugs uh, have on the development uh, of that animal. Um, now this is a this is the real time. This is a real video. So what we're seeing here is actually a rat, uh, a neonate, so a, a postnatal day two or day three rat, um, where we can actually see completely non-invasively right through the skull um, and the skin and the skull right into the brain of the rat. We can actually see the lateral ventricle here. This is with a lower frequency probe. If we go up in frequency and use a very high frequency probe, our 15 megahertz probe you can really see the advantage of having this um, image-guided injection. We can see the needle tracked here in the green, um, so we know where the needle is being admitted, and we can see the anatomy as well. Up here at the top of the image, this is sort of a, a skewed coronal view uh, of the animal where we've got um, a little bit of speckle going on up here. This is the superior sagittal sinus, the major collecting vein in the brain. Um, and then we see the lateral ventricles here on either side, and we're, we're performing an injection in a very, very precise anatomical location. So again, this emphasizes the, the real-time aspect um, of, uh, of the system and the, and the advantages uh, thereof. Now, regular ultrasound imaging is great to pick out anatomical detail, um, but sometimes we need to enhance the contrast, and one way of doing that is to use a microbubble. So this is a two to three micron size bubble with a phospholipid layer and a gas core. And these bubbles oscillate when they're hit with ultrasound, uh, and they give us a very, very strong signal that we're able to distinguish from the background regular, um, regular ultrasound signal. And this is an example of what that looks like. So um, you'll see here when this video sort of, uh, it's in a loop here, when it starts to loop over, you'll see in the, sort of in the background at the sides of the image, you can see the regular B-mode image. 
And then overlaid on top of that, that's the um, nonlinear contrast signal. So this is a, 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 a orthotopic pancreatic tumor. Uh, we're then injecting these microbubbles into the circulation of the animal via the tail vein, and you can see the accumulation of the signal uh, as it comes into the circulation and perfuses this, uh, this tumor in this case. And you can see areas of the tumor which are highly perfused right around here, and then areas which are uh, not as well perfused over here, and there are various um, calculations that we can do um, to assess uh, perfusion using this technique. Um, this is a good example of using uh, not just the ultrasound, but also the contrast and the Doppler functionality. So the Doppler, the ability to um, detect the frequency shifts uh, due to movement. Uh, in other words, detect uh, any kind of movement in the image, uh, such as blood flow, using all of these modalities together to, uh, to um, learn a bit more about the pathology that, that we're trying to study. So this is from Dr. Carola Hanevier. Um, some studies that uh, she did where uh, we've got animals, just regular B-mode imaging of these, uh, these animals. This is a coronal section through a mouse, um, mouse brain. We then turn on the Doppler, and you can see a little bit of blood flow here. Uh, but the use of microbubbles is really the key here. So when using microbubbles, you enhance the contrast, not just in the B-mode, um, but also in the Doppler. So the Doppler signal is much, much more sensitive, and you have much more contrast just in the regular B mode or bright mode uh, ultrasound image. Now to describe this, uh, these images a little bit further, along this top row, uh, this is just imaging, again, um, with and without contrast um, and with and without Doppler here, uh, just a, an animal, a normal wild type animal. And then down here you've got an animal that's had a glioma introduced uh, into the brain. So it's difficult to make any real distinction between uh, you know, anatomy and structure in these two images, but once the microbubble contrast has been introduced, we can now see um, things like lateral ventricles uh, are, are much more clear here, where you have obviously no contrast going in there. Um, and in this case, you've got a mass here which is slightly less echogenic or slightly less bright than the surrounding tissue. Um, and this is uh, indicative of, of some kind of pathology. This is um, likely where that glioma is occurring. Similarly, in the uh, Doppler images where we're looking at blood flow, in a normal animal we see this um, you know, healthy uh, perfusion of the, of the brain tissue through the major vessels here. Whereas in the animal with the glioma, um, this is a grossly um, um, maligned flow here where you have hardly any flow uh, where the glioma appears to be uh, and arguably a bit more flow on the contralateral side here. Um, but this is very disrupted flow in, in that model. So we can then use uh, contrast to enhance not just the anatomy and distinguish uh, the differences in tissue, but also distinguish functional differences in things like blood flow. We can take this a step further uh, and, and really uh, work with the contrast in order to measure differences in, in say, blood volume and be a little bit more quantitative about, uh, about this kind of data. This is some work that was done by Martin Van Raj at, at Sunnybrook Research Institute, um, where they use contrast to generate what they call an ultrasound angiogram here. Uh, and they did this by, um, they did this in a rat, um, and a craniotomy here was required. So this is this sort of more um, rostral part of the brain, the, the sort of forebrain, um, where you can see here a craniotomy has been performed, and you can actually see a shadow where the skull still, still exists on either side. This is where the craniotomy was performed, and you can see a cortex here, and then you can see the underlying brain tissue. And you can actually distinguish anatomically um, what's going on here just based on the orientation of the vessels. In the cortex, the vessels are predominantly uh, in this uh, sort of vertical direction, whereas you have a little bit more, um, not, not quite as well organized vasculature and the underlying tissue. Um, but this is, these are the veins and arteries that feed and drain the, the cortex up here. Um, and again, this is an image that's been enhanced with the uh, ultrasound contrast agent, the microbubbles. We can then turn on the Doppler. Uh, and this is color Doppler. So in this case, uh, the direction of flow is encoded by the color. 
in this case, uh, the red is flow going uh, upwards in the image towards the transducer, uh, and the blue is flow going downwards in the image away from the transducer. So now we've got information not only about where the vessels are, but which direction the blood is flowing, and we can distinguish veins and arteries this way. We can then perform different calculations. Uh, and in this case, they, they uh, indicated um, a, a color scale here that is an estimate of blood volume. So in this case, we're really looking at relative blood volume uh, in, in this case. And um, there are differences, in, many differences in, in hemodynamics between active and non-active parts of the brain. Uh, and this is really a way of getting at doing functional imaging with, uh, purely with ultrasound in this case. Uh, so the combination of these techniques can give us some really powerful information. I want to I move away a little bit from the ultrasound aspect for the time being and just introduce photoacoustics. For those of you who, who are not familiar with photoacoustics, um, I'll just sort of describe the effect. Uh, photoacoustic imaging is essentially the combination of optical and ultrasound imaging. It's a hybrid modality. Uh, so we deliver a nanosecond laser pulse illumination into the tissue, anything that absorbs that laser light heats up a little bit, uh, gives a, a thermoelastic expansion, uh, which then results in a pressure wave or a sound wave which travels through the tissue and we can then detect with our ultrasound transducer. We then generate an image from this just like we would with regular ultrasound. So th that's the sort of long explanation. Um, the short one is you know, light in, absorption, sound out. So we're looking at a fundamentally different signal where we're, we're seeing the we're essentially imaging the absorption of light instead of imaging the reflection of sound. This is what the system looks like. In case you're curious, um, this is the transducer here where we have uh, optical fiber integrated right into the transducer. This is the ultrasound cable here coming in the other side. We deliver the light right out at the end of the probe, so it's always uh, delivered the same way relative to the ultrasound. We get nice reproducible images. Um, this is the enclosure in which we do the imaging, in which you can see the animal imaging platform where we deliver anesthetic. Uh, it's heated so we can keep the animal warm, and there's also leads to monitor ECG and respiration. This is the probe that I just described here, and it's attached to a 3D motor, which allows the translation of the probe uh, in this axis here in order to collect slices and stack them together to make 3D images. Um, we, of course, include the enclosure uh, to avoid exposure to uh, the laser light um, to, to any users. And it's, it's useful to have an enclosure because otherwise you have to black out windows and, and um, uh, enclose an entire room. So instead of that, this is just a, a desktop solution. So you can use this in, in your lab alongside your other uh, equipment. This is the laser here. So all the optics, um, power supply, cooling are all integrated into this cart, which is on wheels. Uh, and then we deliver the laser light through this uh, optical uh, cable here. And this is the Vivo 2100 ultrasound machine. Uh, it's with the real guts of the, of the system uh, from the ultrasound side. So what this gives us is co-registered um, real-time uh, photoacoustics and uh, ultrasound signals. We can do multispectral imaging because we've got a tunable laser. So we can tune it from 680 to 970 nanometers. Um, in order to do this multispectral imaging, and I'll describe that a little later. So here's a here's a, a photoacoustic image. On the left, you've got your um, you know your co-registered B mode or ultrasound image, and on the right, you've got this photoacoustic image. And in this case, we're imaging at 10 uh, 1064 nanometers, and we can see this coronal section through the brain. So I've I've given a, an image of the brain here. Um, histology image of the brain here, just to sort of compare the slice. We get a little bit of anatomy. This is our uh, prototype of 15 megahertz probe. It's a much lower frequency than our other probes. Um, we get a little bit of anatomical detail. This is completely non-invasive, skull and skin intact. And then you can really pick out a lot of detail with the photoacoustics. Part of the reason is to get this signal, uh, we only have to get the ultrasound out of the skull. Whereas in here, we have to get the ultrasound in, it's got to be reflected and come out. In this case, we deliver the light, the sound only has to go one way. So we can be somewhat more sensitive. Um, and we're also looking at something different where there may be minimal um, differences in um, reflection of sound. There are certainly very, very strong differences in the absorption of light. Uh, mostly what absorbs in the, in the body of an animal is um, in the wavelength range that we're using 
is hemoglobin. So at the 680 to 970 nanometer range, we're looking primarily at hemoglobin, which allows us to see the vasculature in the brain. And you can see here clearly, we can see right down to the base of the brain uh, and even into the uh, internal carotid arteries. Another nice thing about doing multispectral imaging is the ability to, to calculate oxygen saturation. We do this because, uh, we're, or, or we can do this because of the different uh, absorption properties of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. So this blue line here is the absorption spectrum for deoxygenated hemoglobin, uh, again, from 650 to 1,000 nanometers. So we get a strong absorption at the shorter wavelengths, and it goes down with the longer wavelengths. Oxygenated hemoglobin looks quite different. So we have a weak absorption at the, the shorter wavelengths, and as the wavelength gets longer, the absorption goes up. Because we have these differing properties, we can image at a couple different wavelengths, do a little bit of math, and have a calculation of oxygen uh, saturation, as well as a calculation of total hemoglobin for doing things like relative blood volume. These images end up looking something like this, where you've got now a color map here. Um, so if you look at the left-hand side of this image, uh, right beside the ultrasound image, you see things that are colored in red are 100% oxygen saturated, and then it's a scale through the white down into the blue, uh, to right down to 0% oxygen saturated. So now we're looking at not just the blood in the brain of this animal, but we're looking at how much oxygen that blood is carrying. Now the, the implications here are fairly obvious in that um, now we can do studies of things like stroke, things like um, functional imaging, just based on how much blood that oxygen is carrying. Um, <clears throat> in this case, it's a very simple demonstration where we change the breathed oxygen con concentration from medical air, 29% oxygen, up to 100% oxygen, and you can see a dramatic change in the signal from this sort of low level, uh, and then it becomes fully oxygen saturated when you turn it up. And of course, by drawing an ROI, we can also do quantification. Very important um, to be able to do that quantification to measure the differences in oxygen saturation in different parts of the brain. For, for doing the studies that I mentioned already, and I'll show some examples of those a little later. Here's a, here's a Doppler image. This is, again, with our 15 megahertz uh, center frequency uh, prototype probe. Um, <clears throat> we sacrifice a little bit on the resolution side, but we really gain in the depth and sensitivity of things. Um, and with the Doppler imaging, this is, again, the color Doppler with things in red are sort of going up in this direction towards the transducer. Things in blue are going down away from the transducer. So now we've got this flow profile, direction of flow profile, and in fact, velocity profile of the blood in that case, where we can even pick out different, uh, different anatomy. Uh, here's the oxygen saturation image that we get with the photoacoustics as well. So you, you'll notice some similarities, some differences, um, and, and this is just uh, due to the differences in the imaging modalities. We get slightly different information from these, and the combination of those is, is something that's very, very powerful. So we can pick out now anatomy here, um, the, the posterior cerebral artery, posterior communicating artery, internal carotid artery, and we can find some of these things uh, with the photoacoustics as well. Um, being able to sort of um, take, put these in the context of, of, of some other imaging study is useful as well to be able to see, for instance, with a micro MRI study where they're um, studying the, uh, the perfusion of the brain, um, you know, they're showing here, um, you know, these transverse hippocampal arteries, which we can kind of see here in the photoacoustic image. So we're able to, uh, to compare these. And in fact, I just took uh, the image that we got here and plopped it on top of this image, and it really co-registers quite well, despite, of course, being a different animal, um, that these things co-register really nicely so we can be a little bit more sure about what we're seeing. We can do this in 3D as well. So we collect, again, those um, slices. We stack them together to generate these 3D volumes. And now you're looking at the Doppler image in the uh, sagittal and the coronal planes, and then we can add that oxygen saturation information again and pick out similarities uh, in these images. And, and note that there are also differences. Um, so as, whereas we may not be quite sensitive to the blood flow up here, it may be too slow or too weak to detect, via Doppler, we can certainly see the blood uh, with photoacoustics since it doesn't rely on the flow of blood and we can detect uh, oxygenation in the cortex and then subcortical structures right down, uh, right down here into the, the lower parts of the brain. 
Uh, and I just wanted to have one, um, oh, I think my slide's a little later actually. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that a, a little bit later. Um, we'll start with the cortex where uh, doing one of these 3D and looking sort of down on the top of the, the skull of the animal, so the, the nose and eyes are over here and the back of the head is over here, um, we can pick out you know different structures with the oxygen saturation as well as the total hemoglobin maps. Um, and be able to, to determine, you know, where's the inferior cerebral vein, the superior sagittal sinus, and this kind of thing. And, of course, be able to do measurements on those. This is what I wanted to, to mention also is the deep brain imaging. Um, and th this image doesn't look like much necessarily, but if you recognize some of the structures uh, and we, you know where you're imaging, which we do uh, because of the anatomical uh, data that we get from the ultrasound image, we can identify this as the circle of Willis. So, Again, this is a projection looking from the top of the head right down to the bottom of the brain. And if we zoom in on that bottom part of the brain, we can identify the circle of Willis and, and different things, poss possibly even the, the um, middle cerebral artery, the internal carotid, certainly. Um, and this is important, too, again, for stroke studies and things like that. Um, now, to my knowledge, this hasn't been done before either. So even though it doesn't look like much, I think this really does have a lot of implications for doing uh, a lot of really interesting work. Um, one of those implications is doing ischemia imaging or, or stroke imaging. Um, this is obviously an area of wide, uh, wide area of study. And we can then use our different modalities such as color Doppler, oxygen saturation, and total hemoglobin to generate um, a, a picture of what this might look like in an animal model. So this is a mouse model, adult mouse. Um, it was an embolic stroke uh, which was generated in, in, the, uh, in the MCA. Um, and we can see here, uh, the, sort of an interesting story about this is the we started imaging the animals with the stroke, um, and we saw you know a little bit of signal with the Doppler, um, not very much oxygen saturated blood, but then we saw in the cortex a lot of this total hemoglobin signal showing up. Um, you know, I thought it was a bit unusual that we weren't seeing more signal, more oxygenated signal, certainly, in, in this animal. So we went on to the next one. We saw basically the same thing. We then imaged the normal animal, uh, and then all of a sudden we see all this blood flow, um, very, very highly oxygen-saturated blood, and then we didn't see that sort of um, total hemoglobin signal, that possibly, uh, you know, uh, hemorrhaging or edema that's going on in, in these animals. So we can now measure obvious things like uh, blood flow, oxygen saturation, total hemoglobin, and again, quantify them. Uh, and this is what this is showing here. So in the stroke animal number one and stroke animal number two, the overall 3D oxygen saturation in that brain is way down compared to the normal. Um, the, 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 the percent vascularity is way down, or the percent of flowing blood is way down, obviously. But interestingly, the total hemoglobin is way up in, the, in those uh, animals with the stroke. So th this is very interesting data. Um, Preliminary, but um, very interesting data and relevant to, to a lot of different uh, models of ischemia and stroke. Uh, this is, again, looking at oxygen saturation uh, dynamically, essentially in real time in this case. Uh, and this was done with um, a model of CSD, or cortical spreading depression. So this is um, a, a, a sort of depolarizing wave which spreads uh, from the anterior part or the rostral part of the brain uh, to the caudal part um, slowly, and this, this is a thought to precede uh, migraines and this kind of thing, uh, and it's generated by a KCL injection um, right, right sort of here in the forebrain, uh, and then this wave will slowly spread backwards uh, over the course of uh, a few minutes. Um, and we wanted to see what, uh, or this group rather that we worked with wanted to see, uh, you know, what are the he hemodynamic changes that are associated with this cortical spreading depression. Um, so we drew several regions of interest, uh, you know, at various distances from the initial injection site, which was up here. And then we can trace over time, so we're looking at time on the x-axis down here. We can trace over time and then measure the oxygen saturation over time. And just by looking at this trace, you can see that um, in some areas uh, we, we have effects that occur very, very soon after the injection, and then other effects that are, occur a little later. So, for example, this, uh, this sort of turquoise area here, you can see there's a, a very sharp drop, which occurs later than this yellow area here, where you have this drop occurring a little, a little sooner. Um, 
deeper areas, indeed uh, subcortical areas, you can see this, these changes occur even later. So we can then have this time course, and this again is the real-time imaging aspect. Now we've got this time course for the vascular effects that are associated with this um, induced model of cortical spreading depression. Um, we also, uh, there's a, a, a PLOS-1 paper published recently um, from uh, Guevara and all, um, Lodigensky, Gregory Lodigensky's lab, uh, that was looking at an inflammatory injury induced in the newborn rat. So this was a, they, they actually used the image guidance uh, capabilities of the system to do an injection of uh, LPS uh, into these uh, neonate rats. And then they looked at oxygen saturation and tried to determine, you know, if this inflammation injury caused by the LPS was also causing uh, oxygen saturation uh, changes. And they indeed, they indeed did see in these LPS injected animals, they saw a reduction uh, in oxygen saturation in, in various areas. And interestingly, these, did, these were not completely explained by, by vascular degeneration. They assessed the vascularity in a different way, I think uh, by histology. Um, and they saw that 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 did not account for these differences. So these are uh, real real effects that are being measured here, um, you know, in oxygen saturation that aren't necessarily vessel um, vascular degeneration dependent. So some very interesting work here, uh, you know. And again, this is in rats in this case, in these neonate rats. I just wanted to include a quote from the actual uh, paper, um, and they say, the ability to examine region, regional saturation offers a new way to monitor injury and understand physiological disturbance non-invasively. And this, is, this kind of sums up uh, you know, what we have to offer as far as uh, you know, the ultrasound and photoacoustics for brain imaging. There are also uh, some other applications, namely contrast agent applications. So um, right now we've got this endogenous contrast. We can see blood, but there are many different contrast agents which are being developed, such as gold nanorods, carbon nanotubes, um, liposomes, that kind of thing, which absorb light in this uh, wavelength range. And these can be used for things like molecular imaging. Uh, we provide some tools in order to not just um, you know, see these agents, but characterize them. So in this case, we can put uh, agents, I think in this case it's just ICG, indocyanin green. Excuse me, we've put this into a tube. Um, we image it across the whole wavelength range of the laser, and then we're able to generate this absorption profile or this photoacoustic intensity profile based on wavelength. And we now know the sort of spectral characteristics of this agent. We can load those into the software. And then by doing multispectral imaging or using multiple wavelengths, we can unmix this signal from this agent from the background uh, blood signals. Uh, this is a proof of concept of what that might look like. So in this case, um, we had an animal where a very small surgery was done, a very small um, hole was drilled in the mouse skull. Uh, we did an injection of methylene blue into the lateral ventricle on the one side, on the right side here. Um, and you can actually see in these cross-sectional images, you can actually see the injection site right here. Uh, then, of course, the ventricles are all, all linked, so that dye, that methylene blue dye, which absorbs in the near-infrared range, spread throughout the brain, uh, or throughout the ventricles in the CNS, and we were able to generate this image of the, uh, of the ventricles, essentially, um, by unmixing the methylene blue signal from the background blood signal. And that's what you're seeing here, just the methylene blue signal. Uh, this is just different um, uh, resolutions due to the different frequencies of transducers used. So this is a lower frequency probe and a higher frequency probe. Interestingly, uh, you can also generate these images with M micro MRI, but for the, uh, all the advantages that I described earlier, it, it, this, can, this can be done um, a little bit more quickly, a little bit more inexpensively, um, and arguably with, um, with better uh, temporal resolution um, than some MRI or other techniques. And then you also get more data out of this too. You're not just getting data about, say, ventricle size, but you get functional data from blood vessels, uh, blood flow data uh, from the microbubbles and from uh, Doppler imaging and that kind of thing. So it's really an advantage to have these multiple techniques uh, all at your fingertips at once. 
just want to include one slide about the future of brain imaging and where I think this is going. We're, we're fairly early on as far as ultrasound is concerned um, in the neuroscience field because in the clinic, uh, you know, the human skull is much too thick to, um, to really realistically get through at this time with ultrasound. But for the preclinical market, there's a lot, to, a lot I think we can offer. Um, I mentioned already brain function. You know, there have been papers published about uh, using Doppler or using photoacoustics, uh, measuring the oxygen saturation, and really pushing this forward and, and making a more sort of turnkey applications for, for doing brain function. I think that's a, a really key, a really sort of obvious first step for this technology. Um, there's also, you know, being able to image uh, hemorrhages, um, you know, uh, blood-brain barrier disruption, this kind of thing. This was some work that was done with uh, Richard Price and Kelsey Timby uh, at the University of Virginia where they're actually using focused uh, high-intensity ultrasound to disrupt the blood-brain barrier in very, very specific locations. Um, and this is one of the brains they sent me here. This is a rat brain uh, where they introduced this, um, uh, you know, they, they actually caused a little bit of hemorrhaging here and they were able to uh, disrupt the blood-brain barrier. That's why you see the, the blood left over here. Um, and being able to image this kind of thing, I think non-invasively, I think would be very a very powerful technique, so that we wouldn't have to resort uh, to some of these, um, you know, terminal procedures. Uh, you could do this over time, and monitor changes in the same animal over time using this non-invasive technique with photoacoustics. Um, there's obviously, you know, ischemia and, and interventional procedures, which I, I sort of mentioned earlier, um, but there's, there's a lot that can be done with that, specifically with things like being able to image, you know, right down uh, through the whole brain, right down into the circle of Willis to be able to, to, you know, see the effect of some of those interventional procedures. And there's also molecular imaging as well. So this is from the, the Kircher lab um, in Nature Medicine where they're using a probe uh, to identify a glioma in the brain of an animal. So even if it's, it's not um, very obvious on a uh, just regular ultrasound image, we can use different probes, carbon nano, I think it was carbon nanotubes in this case, in order to tag specific cells and do some real molecular imaging. And, and again, using that spectral imaging or spectral um, unmixing uh, to be able to distinguish the different kinds of signal um, using different wavelengths with photoacoustics. There's also the option of, of using cranial windows. Uh, this is something we've done before. You can clearly see this is a higher frequency probe, so the skull is, is um, the sound, it's more difficult to get the sound through the, the skull. But if you remove the skull, you can get some really, really nice uh, anatomy here and, and see a lot. And there are different um, techniques being developed for doing cranial windows where we were able to keep that window open without um, the effects of brain swelling and this kind of thing and, and have the animal survive and do multiple imaging um, sessions and have better sensitivity because we don't need to, to compete and get that sound through the skull. So there's some, there's some developments there that I can see really helping, um, helping to bring uh, uh, ultrasound um, to the fore as a preclinical imaging method for, for neuroscience. Um, that, that concludes the presentation. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to, uh, to Mina for now uh, to uh, answer a couple questions. All right. Thank you very much, Drew. That was a very interesting uh, uh, range of uh, models and approaches that we can use with the uh, ultrasound, high-frequency ultrasound system and photoacoustics. Uh, we're taking a few questions. I have um, uh, categorized questions that uh, that walk along the same line of thinking um, and, and bundle these questions out for you, Drew. Um, the question is, is, most of the data were in mice, but um, there were some data on rats. Um, could you comment on how deep uh, can this imaging accurately portray the brain? And uh, if so, does it have to be with an open skull versus can, have, can we have the skull and skin intact? Um, and the third question along the same lines is, is it possible to uh, investigate transient ischemia models like MCA occlusion um, using uh, uh, intraluminal uh, suture? Um, any comments on that, Drew? Uh, thanks, Mina. Yeah, the, the, um, those are great questions. The, the depth issue, it, it, it comes up uh, all the time. I mean, I, I showed you images imaging through the mouse brain where we can see right, right down to the bottom. Obviously, using uh, lower frequency helps with this. Um, and obviously, you know, removing the skull helps tremendously with this as well. So there are certain, you know, advantages, but, you know, 
the, the goal is always uh, non-invasive procedures. Uh, and, and I think I've shown that at least in a mouse we can do that. Um, in the rat, I, you know, I did show you some neonatal rat images where the skull is fairly thin. There's also windows like through the fontanel where you can see very, very clearly uh, the, the neonatal rat brain. Of course, as they get older, the, the skull becomes more calcified, it becomes much more difficult to, um, to access the brain. So for rat, I think we are limited in depth. Uh, it is going to be more difficult. Um, you know, there are, are different things that we're working with to try and improve that. Um, but I think the biggest improvement is going to be using this 15 megahertz probe um, and maybe being able to see at least cortical structures in the rat, uh, I think is reasonable. It's something we still have to try. We haven't done a lot of work with rats, but, um, but it, it, it's sort of uh, on the list. Um, as far as um, the typical duration of an imaging session for a single animal, it, it really depends. You can make it as long or short as you want is the sort of um, the easy answer. But you know, while we're doing one of those 3D uh, oxygen saturation maps, that can take you know anywhere, say uh, you know, two to two to six minutes, um, kind of thing, to generate one of those images. Uh, of course, it can be done faster if you don't want as high resolution. You can just collect fewer slices. Uh, in some cases, maybe you just need three slices: one for the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain. So um, there's different ways to to get around the, the speed of imaging. Um, you can also, uh, I'm just sort of reading a question here, Mina's pointing out to me, um, they're, they're asking about uh, incorporating uh, stimulation methods, say, um, you know, stimulating peripheral nerves or mechanical stimulation or electrical stimulation. So this kind of work has been done already by a couple of groups where they're doing whisker stimulation or hind paw or forepaw stimulation and seeing activity in the brain. It's not something we've, um, we've done uh, directly with our system, but you know, this is the, the whole potential of what I've been talking about um, opens the door to doing those kind of techniques. Uh, and, and I would welcome anyone who's interested in doing that, any kind of uh, collaboration, we'd be happy to talk about collaborating uh, and, and generating some, some data in order to investigate those possibilities as well. You know, it was also, uh, you said you, there was also something about transient ischemia models. The, um, the stroke model that I showed earlier was, in fact, a transient ischemia model. So there's a, a lot of different models out there from, um, you know, just uh, uh, carotid artery ligations to embolic uh, stroke models and that kind of thing. So those things are all feasible uh, with this technique. And, in fact, I would say it's easier to do those kind of techniques with our system um, as opposed to something like an MRI because the animal, you have access to the animal while you're doing the imaging. Um, so there are certain interventional, interventional procedures, um, like I showed the um, uh, image-guided injection procedures, which we, we can still do even while imaging. So I think all of those things, um, you know, those external stimulation techniques and introduction of agents and cells uh, are, are really doable. All right. Thank you, uh, Drew. Those were interesting questions. I think uh, a couple of them, um, so a couple of the questions that you guys are asking is with re respect to the list of references, the references that Drew had mentioned in the um, in the in the presentation will be included in a bibliography, and we will send it uh, send it around. Remember that the webinar will be recorded uh, is is recorded, sorry, and will be made available uh, to you uh, as a link in in. in our continued uh, communications. Uh, this brings me to just a few um, updates that uh, may, be, uh, may be running through your minds, questions that you may have. Um, more about the Vivo Laser, uh, it is available at these links uh, that you see right here on your screen. Um, you can learn more about the system and post your inquiries uh, in, in the support tab uh, on our website at www.visualsonics.com. Uh, learn more about neurobiology and any updates. Again, uh, the link is uh, provided for you here. Uh, and then um, to know more about publications, uh, we do have bibliography available again on the website. It is on the neurobiology webpage uh, and also will be provided to you um, uh, if, if an inquiry comes through the support uh, tab on the website. Um, 
If you're interested in showing your expertise, uh, there are the Vivo Ambassador. There is the Vivo Ambassador program. I'll learn more about it out here. How how to how to become one and be become a part of this uh, community. It's a community of scientists who use the Vivo uh, imaging solutions. Uh, they are both novice and advanced users. Um, also, uh, we have our partnerships with the Jove publication where you can um, show your expertise by publishing in their uh, vi visualized journal, video journals. Uh, of course, uh, share your expertise at conferences and um, let, let your colleagues know what is possible with imaging uh, and imaging the brain and its pathologies. We do support your uh, venture in that respect with the Vivo Young Investigators Award. You can see more information by just um, submitting your inquiry in the customer support tab on our website. Um, Keep in mind that there is a funding announcement for those of you in the, uh, in the United States. Uh, the National Institutes of Health has um, announced the BRAIN Initiative, uh, which uh, funds uh, advancing innovative neurotechnology. So uh, take advantage of this and see, um, see how your research can advance the field. Also in Europe through the Horizon 2020 program, uh, let us know. Keep, uh, uh, keep, us in, keep us in touch so that we can collaborate and uh, help you along your research. Uh, for any uh, inquiries on VSI grants, uh, on grant support, we do have a program in-house to help you justify the need uh, for imaging with the Vivo Solutions. Okay, that brings me to the end of uh, our session today. Uh, on imaging brain and its pathologies. I really appreciate your time and effort, but please tune in uh, for a technology update in the month of October. Uh, it will be given on by Andrew Needles, our Senior Manager in Product Innovation. He'll be telling you what's, what's new, what's upcoming, and how uh, the Vivo Imaging Solutions can advance your, your research uh, and next generation research. All right, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, in October. Bye for now.